beautiful early to mid June 20 inch Susquehanna River smallmouth. We'll let him back in there so he can go find some other uh, cicadas to eat, maybe. We'll see. Hey folks, I'm on the Susquehanna River with my buddy Jake today and uh, I'm gonna do, before we start fishing, I want to do a brief walkthrough of my, my inflatable, the star rival fish. Uh, with everything that I've put on it, I'm gonna hand the, uh, the camera over to you Jake and we're just gonna do a brief walkthrough. Um, obviously I've done the, I've, I've put the ultralight 1103 AC uh, that has been a lot of fun you can get up to 6.8 miles per hour with this I was just coming down a second ago going with current I was hitting 7.1 um, because it's so lightweight it's it's got great speed we'll start at the at the back um, in order to get the ultralight 1103 AC three horsepower electric outboard on there uh, worked with with trade innovative sportsmen uh, he made this adapter plate and the way that this actually works with the four bolt pattern needed to get it onto the inflatable which is the same as as any of my accessories which are track related are with these items these are yak attack uh, switch pad flexible mounts and you glue these on and, and I've got a video of, of how I did this entire build but this uh, yak attack switch pad flexible mount with the with the mighty mount switch on top is uh, is how we basically, you know, I'll, I'll pull this knob off and you can kind of see real quick that there's a there's a T-bolt that that's threading onto, and the, the T-bolt goes down into that track. So everything is based on being able to glue that to the flat surface of the inflatable. The inflatable itself is actually three chambers. There's a center chamber. Uh, which I think can go up to, it says floor, you can get up to 8 PSI. Uh, I think I actually have it a little higher than that. The sides here and here are 3 PSI. I actually leave them loose. Um, they're a little bit more forgiving if they're loose. But I like the floor being hard. It gives it some rigidity. Um, you can see I have a, an anchor off the back. And if we move forward, you can see I have not one, but two anchor wizards. I got, you know, I got the one off the front. If I want to face upstream or, or into the wind, or if I want to fish downstream, I'll just drop this one real quick. This has been very useful in uh, in a lot of the filming. I, I use this one to film Jody Queen up at Candlewood, and being able to get the right positions for for both fishing and filming has been important. Um, <clears throat> Moving forward, I have my black pack and I have, you know, a couple rod holders up top there with the 90 degree adapters. Uh, I put some Omega Pro rod holders here. So I have four of them pointing backwards. And that's important as we move underneath overhanging branches and, and skipping, you know, Senkos up into these, you know, these shoreline points uh, to be able to go in there and not have things sticking straight up and, and have, you know, have the overhanging branches or or even if you're on a lake and you fish docks, it's nice to go right underneath the docks. So horizontal rod storage pointed back is a, is a good thing. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on this. This is critical and we're going to come back to this, but this is important for any inflatable that you carry this with you. Uh, it's a K pump mini and you know, the the biggest thing that people are, are afraid of with an inflatable is what? Jake, what do you think? Going flat, hole in it. Yeah, like getting that. a hole in it. Yeah. From from what? From hook, from hooks? Rock. From a rock? Well, it's not going to happen. Uh, it, it can't happen with a hook. It's more likely that it's a fish's spine. And we're going to we're going to touch on how you do a really quick um, repair. So I have the K-pump here. Or it could be a motor, Jeff. It could be a motor. It could be Mike Iaconelli running me over. <laughs> Actually, we'll look at that patch here. Um, come around this side. We're gonna, I'll, I'll jump right to it. Um, this patch right here, I was filming with Mike Iaconelli and he, he bumped the throttle and the Torquedo and the, and the three horsepower electric outboard cut two 
lines there and there. And this is a patch job that I did. It's a more permanent patch job, but in order to do the, the short term just to get off the water, it only took me like 15 minutes and, and I'm, we're gonna do it today. But this stuff, Tear Aid Type B, is, is what's gonna get you through the rest of your day. So you never have to worry about it. I'm like a rotor molded kayak. If you have a hole in it, you know, and you're out there, you're just taking on water. Um, there's, there's no quick fix for it. This is a nice quick fix that gets you through the rest of your day. You get to enjoy the rest of your adventure. Um, we're gonna use a little bit of this a little bit later. We're gonna poke a hole in this and I'll show you how quick it is to, to repair it. But you gotta have this stuff with you, so. The more permanent fix is, you know, you get some of the material, and, and I'll do that at the end of the video, once I get home. You sand, this is just a sanding block. You know, you sand it, you get the aqua seal on there, and you you deflate it, you slap it on there, and uh, you know, you let it sit for a day, and then it's a, it's a very good permanent fix. So, um, I'll go ahead and set that down for now. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at some of the other parts. I put the foot control steering here for the uh, for the Torquedo and Beyond that I've been playing around with something else This is a stand-up stick steer. So what I did is I came off the front of the track And I kept going forward to these yak attack tie down eyelets and went up here so basically and, and I'll show you how it works, but as I'm standing I can move this side to side and it'll steer the motor. Um, I have the motor up so I don't have the tension to really show you that moving right now, but what what the pivot point is, is the Yak Attack screw ball in this track right here. And then I have this clamp in between and basically I have a long threaded um, quarter 20 rod that goes all the way up to the top here and down there, it's it's sort of flexible, so it's kind of soft steering, but it's but it really works. Um, the the one thing I want to mention about the inflatables was actually three things why this is a perfect perfect vessel for fishing a, a river like the Susquehanna, or even if you're doing, you know, I've, I've had it in the uh, the back bay areas behind the behind the outer banks. Uh, going for redfish and and trout and flounder um lots of shallow water fisheries it'd be a great snakehead platform and the reason is that it goes shallower than a rotor molded boat if we look at your um your rotor molded boat here i know that you know we have it beached but you can see this mud line from there to there you're you need about this much depth right if you, if you look at where I have the inflatable, and I, I only brought it as far as I needed to, to beach it, and you're just to the second knuckle. So you're either going with this much depth required to get through, or this much. So what that does, the shallow water access allows you to, to really go where you want it. And, and this, the river isn't really low right now, but it will be. It absolutely will be. And being able to move wherever you want to is, is super nice. So shallow, shallow draft is one of the things. The other is stealth. Um, when you when you come up, up on an area with a rotor molded boat and you hit a rock, it goes boom. And I know out here it sends a sends that noise out and you just see fish. You see the reverse wakes just going in all directions and you're not catching those fish. So stealth is is an important part of that. But the other is stability, and everyone talks about width in, in, in different designs of boats and is it wide enough to be a good standard. It's just a different level and a different quality of stability standing on an inflatable. And really what that means is it's, it's somehow more forgiving. And it's, it's you know, when you stand on a, on a rotomolded boat, it's kind of wobbly like this when you're in an inflatable it, its primary stability is amazing and it just doesn't want to go down so you know when you stand up and, you, and you're in a rotor motor boat and you, and you send those shock waves out of, of being wobbly in the boat 
it sends wake out into the area that you're looking to fish close to you. With this, it's so, it, it fights you so much. And even if you do lean, that it's just a different level of stability. So combining shallow draft, stealth and stability, it's like the perfect shallow water, uh, shallow water setup. But I do have it set up with the, um, with the depth finder deeper water and, and I put this on here just to show you that I have it there um, you know with the yak attack uh, depth finder mount uh, on some gear track that and, and this is basically the premise where I use the the switch pads I, I make bridges with the gear track one GT 175 in between two of the switch pads I did that with a foot control steering I did it with the torpedo throttle mount and this T-Rain and the anchor wizard and everything else right um, so I got my depth finder here where I want it, and I got the switchblade transducer arm back here. I'll go ahead and, and pull that out. I'm actually not going to use it. I'm going to I'm going to take this off because I, I just don't need it today in this fishery. Yeah, we shouldn't need it. I don't think. No. Um, and I'll take off. This is my this this is my total lithium setup that I use whenever I use move this. Um, this Humminbird Helix 10 from uh, from boat to boat. The, these two kind of travel together, and I got plenty of power in there. I actually keep the charger in there, so it's a good setup. I'm gonna put it back in the truck, um, but we'll get it out there, and I'll show you some footage. We'll catch some smallmouth. Um, but Jake, I got a gift for you though. This is a this is a live target. They don't make these anymore. This is, I think I'm down to seven after I give you this one. This one's for you. <laughs> but it, but it's it's got strings attached. I understand it's got strings attached. It's but got, I mean, in reality, since you bailed on me yesterday. You're going to give me a hard time about bailing after you got my COVID <laughs> shot, man. I felt horrible. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, Jeff. So you're going to tie this on. You're going to catch smallmouth with it. Before you catch smallmouth with it, you're going to poke a hole in my boat. That's so you're going to swing it hard and then rip into it. And then I'm going to show you how easy it is to fix it. And, and you're going to tie me and see how long it takes me to get back on the water. Because I think when people think of inflatable, they're like, oh, I can't do that. I, I, as soon as a hook gets near it, it's, it's going to pop. And I've had inflatables, you know, my whole life. I mean, it's been, you know, it's been absolutely it's this side what are you pointing at I got you had a big mosquito on your cheek All right. <laughs> i've had the inflatables in uh in cataracts and other boats the first inflatable i had was actually an odc 1018 it was a it was a cataract a one-man cataract in fact in 2003 i was featured in an article in bassmaster magazine it's going solo for for river smallmouth and it was me in a kayak, and it was my buddy Greg Phipps. So I kind of, you know, the, the David Hart, who writes, who wrote for Bassmaster, wanted to, you know, to do this. I'm like, you should, you should also look at the inflatables too. And we brought Greg Phipps along on a New River float trip. And, and the advantages of the inflatables again: stealth, shallow draft, stability. Um, but I want to show you. You know, it's it's not that big of a deal if you get a hole in it if you have the right stuff, which is K Pump Mini, Tear Aid. You're up, Jake. All right, you got that crankbait tied on there. Mm -hmm. You think you can poke a hole in this boat? I'm gonna try. All right, give it hell. It's really hard to do. Um, this hook is not puncturing this stuff really easy. So, like, I, I mean, I, I've, I'm hitting it, and I've already knocked an eye off the crankbait. So, I mean, it, it's hitting there. Um, you know, I don't. Keep trying. Yeah, I'm gonna give Go give it give it a shot. So, I uh, went ahead and tied this on to a casting rod with straight braid. This is a top water rod. Uh, because I, I, I broke the line on my spinning rod when this thing hit the 
the side of this boat. So this you're, is, you're swinging it pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm schwacking it. Like, there's no, I'm. you told me I can break stuff, so I'm going to break it. Hey. So, one way or the other, something's getting broken. So we're going to give her a shot. Tell you what, man, you, you, you seem to be struggling. Let's let's just grab a pair of pliers, grab oh. that hook, and just and just point blank, just put a hole in it. Cause cause you're not you're not getting it done by swinging it. And and I kind of figured that would be the case. Cause I've set so the, you set me up for failure. I, totally, <laughs> I totally did. So you know I've I've set the hook on um, on a fish that wasn't there so many times with the jerk bait and winter and, and had the had the jerk bait come flying at the the tube whether it's the the seagull fish skiff i got or the counter raft i had years ago that juan Ruth is still running and uh and you just don't get holes in it that way yeah so and these i mean these are fresh hooks too these aren't dull hooks like this is straight out of the box like yep. i mean I, I'm, I'm impressed with the durability of it because that's you hear so many people like what if a what if a hook flies back and hits you? Then you're gonna sink. Like, well, probably not. Right. You're probably not. So grab a pair of pliers. There's a. There should be one up on my seat. Okay. And um, just just put a hole in it somewhere. The just, pliers. Yeah. Grab the hook. Grab the hook and just just dig it in there, man. Cause I gotta show people how to. How to fix it. Did you get it? It's in there. Can we go all the way in? Let's see. All right, you are in there with pliers. Okay, pull it out. Yep, you can do that. And it's not losing it really fast, but we do have a hole there. And I can hear a little bit of a hiss. We're gonna go over how you how you actually identify where, bear with me, I'm pulling this out to where there's water. If you knew that there was a leak and you didn't know specifically where, where's your hole, man? Do you remember? I'm just throwing some. I can hear it. That's it. Okay. Usually you do this with soapy water, but it's. I think if it was, if it had a way to. There it is. You know what I mean. Cool. Like, do that again. So you take your hand, you cup it, you pull it up over. And you can see where it bubbles there. Cool. All right, I'm gonna fix it. It's right there. Then I'll hand you the the camera, and I want you to, I want you to time me. All right, we're gonna time how long it takes me to use the tear aid to repair this hole. Ready, set, go. All right. So I got that spot. I'm just gonna dry it a little bit. I can see where it is. And I know that I need a, a patch. It's only maybe about that big. We'll open this up. I've already used some of this. So come right up here. I got a pair of scissors. I'm gonna cut a little patch. It's big enough to to just cover it. Peel that back. I've already dried it. And again, this is this is a this is a temporary fix that's gonna get you to enjoy the rest of your day. Push that on there. I'm ready to go. Stop. That was a minute. That was that was 57.78 seconds. So and that yeah. was during an explanation process too. Right, right. It's it's simple. It's quick. So enjoy the stability, shallow draft and stealth that inflatables have and don't worry about it as long as you have and, and if it's a really bad hole like it was with with Mike you know slicing the whole thing open 
That one took me about 15 minutes because I had to get the boat up out of the water, drain the water out. I mean, he had two gashes in it that big. And I had enough of that, you know, of this material, the Terry Type B, to, to cover the whole thing. Slapped it on there, pumped it back up, which I didn't have to with this one. Um, and I was, I was good to go. I finished filming the, the install video on his, uh, you know, Hobie Pro Angler 12 360 with the 1103. So, all right, let's go catch some fish, man. Good deal. Nice job, man. Better one? Yep. One thing about triple hooks, you gotta be careful. The bad boys will get in your hand. other fun ways to catch them but I don't think there's more fun ways to catch them than, than burning a whopper plopper or a buzzbait yep I'm going upright again because what makes it even more fun is seeing them doing it yeah like watching them just rocket towards it and yeah and you get you, that more if you're standing you I mean you saw that one's wake didn't you uh we'll see if it showed up on camera I think it probably showed up pretty good okay yeah, yeah. I mean I, he waked it like as soon as it hit the water, <laughs> I'm like, ah, yeah. <laughs> here it comes. Like, I like it. The anticipation. And you got to be careful. Like, sometimes I'll set the hook too early. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you got to kind of just be patient. Wait for the weight. Wait until you feel the weight of the fish. Yeah. And, and that's hard to do, especially if it's a big one. Yep. You know, you see, you see a big body smallmouth come up halfway out of the water. And you know, like it's, I don't know, waiting's out the window. Like, that's. You gotta do it. Mm, there he is. Good jump. Nope. He likes your fins. I don't have fin right now. Alright. Behind the eye, but look at the pretty colors on that one. She's fat. We're seeing a number of the cicadas that we've had down in Maryland. We're, we're seeing them start to uh, attach up here. And there's Eddie behind one of these bridge pilings. I watched three big fish come up and uh, and eat the cicada. I mean, you could look right up and see it come up and eat it. And Jake had one big fish blow up on a, a gold um, gold whopper proper. I chose this one. It's called Yoda, and it's it's to me looks the most Brudex cicada like. It's got a little bit of a little bit of orange up there. Overall, it's just the kind of the right overall color for. Uh, it's not it's not at all a minnow color. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to show you how I can um, 
move upstream, standing up in sight fishing. Um, we're on the side of the river that is fairly clear. We get over to the, uh, the side that has a north branch and it's, it's a little bit muddier. So we're going to do top one on this side, probably move upstream and then come down and maybe power fish a little bit with jackhammer and something else. But I want to see if we can capitalize on these uh, cicadas first. All right, so normally I have the, the magnet up here, but because I'm going to be standing up, I put it on my ankle. And get that on there. And I'm going to work up this bank with uh, with the stick steer. I'll show you what that looks like. But you can tell, you know, just from my moving my feet, it's all the same setup here. I'm just going to go upright and I'll do it with my hand. Fish. Nice net job. All right, he was uh, right on the upstream side of that grass little pat patch right there. And it was important, you know, that I was able to, to angle that cast up in there underneath that overhanging branch. Um, I really think that's a critical part of of this pattern is those sidearm cast to be able to get these, you know, get the top water baits right underneath the, um, you know, right underneath the canopy to where these fish want to be. That's a good one. We'll let him back in. Thank you. Beautiful fish. All right, so we uh, switched up sides from the river. We we're getting beat down by the sun over on that other side and our shaded trees were becoming really non-existent or few and far between. So with the sun position, we changed to this side because we have trees protecting us and in turn protecting the smallmouth. Um, it's gonna give them that shade that they're comfortable in. And you also have the canopy trees where we expect to have the things dropping where they can eat. Um, with that change came water condition change. We, uh, we, we got into some much dirtier water over here. Um, and that's how the Susquehanna is. One side will be good, one side will be bad. Sometimes it's, it's like that. But with that, we changed, I changed the color of my, of my topwater lure just to give them the ability to be able to see it a little quicker and, and key in on it and not miss it as much. It's um, loon, isn't it? Uh, yeah, black loon. I, I'm not... I'm not sure what river to see calls it, but um, the big thing here is like, you'll still get the same amount of bites as you would with a clear lure, but a lot of times in that dirty water, they're gonna miss that clear lure, that clear belly, because they don't have something to key in on. So they're, they're you know, they're going after a sound and well, sometimes they're a little behind on that, but this will help them get it. There are not many. Like I said, the cicadas are just starting here, but I do see one. And I, I saw him buzzing around. And uh, there he is. It is the Brood X. 
So I think as time goes on, there'll be more of these and they will, they will absolutely key in even more on the surface than they, they have been. But this is, I think, oh, there's some deer up there bedding. I just spooked them. But that's the first one. Oh, there's another one on the surface. There's definitely cicadas here. Here, here comes one, man. Good fish. It's not bad. He's in that current. Oh, you dodged the net. How did you do that? No, get over. I can tell you saw that one occur. I saw the eat. It was fun to watch. <laughs> so can I tell the camera what you did? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I'm reeling this thing down and, and, it, and something popped it and I didn't see what it was, but it was this little fella right here. Isn't that little? <laughs> and Jeff just, oh my God! <laughs> Biggest smile on his face. <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, it's not bad, but that's a good one. He came out. He came yeah. out after it. Yeah. It's I, cool. I mean, he, uh, there was no, he wasn't being shy at all. And he just ran into my boat. Um, I switched it up to the bone color because I wasn't getting anything on black, but that's what he hit. All right, Jeff's hooked up. We uh, worked this bank, didn't get much, but uh, I, I threw the subsurface crankbait, the one that we used, cut the hole in the boat, different color, and um, you know, hooked up. It's a good fish. It's muddier water here, and that subsurface. I used the black one instead of the, the kind of green and um, cause I figured the black would show up nicer. Ah. Well, that's one way to net them. Yeah. <laughs> then you go, see you later. All right, we've gone, how far up do you think we've gone? Oh, at least, at least six miles. Six miles up and we're turning around and heading back. Uh, the Harrisburg gauge, do you think it's like four and a half? Four and a half at Harrisburg. I want to say it was like eight at Sunbury. Okay, around eight at Sunbury. It's been a nice level to, to just put in somewhere and go upstream. And now we sort of have a, um, an afternoon float trip back to, the, uh, back to where our vehicles are. So it's been a fun day so far. We'll see if we can get a couple more bigs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hello fishy. Nice to see you. You think he goes 20? Oh yeah. You sure? Yeah, yeah that's a 20. I'm gonna let him breathe. I, I think he's close. I think he's 20 and a quarter. You think so? Yeah. Closed mouth, 20. BS, stretching. <laughs> just 20. <laughs> That's a 20 in the corner. And it's just C-130s. <laughs> we just had that conversation yesterday. We did, I don't like how noisy they are, but yeah. 20 incher. Thank you. Beautiful fish. Thank you. I'm gonna let you go now. All right, beautiful. Early to mid-June, 20-inch Susquehanna River smallmouth. 
we'll let him back in there so he can go find some other uh, cicadas to eat maybe. We'll see. So these are the two baits that we've been productive with. They're round, they push a lot of water, and they stay near the surface. This one stays on the surface with that, that prop. So whopper plopper, you know, is gonna continue to produce. This one is a, is a subsurface. It really dives less than a foot. Um, this one's made by Live Target. It, they no longer make this particular model, but you can do man's baby one minus or, or any number of crankbaits that have that short little almost wake bait like lip on a very round um, sort of light bulb shaped plug. So if you if you listen in the background and I don't know whether the the audio is is going to pick it up, but there is a very low drone on that hillside. We didn't have it where we started and we've come up several miles and we're starting to see the cicadas. Um, does this look like a cicada? Does this look like a cicada? No, but they're looking up. They're, they have their heads up and they're, here's another one he handed me. That one actually kind of does look like a cicada. That's called cicada. Is it? <laughs> well, the point is that it's top water and they're, they're looking upwards. So one thing I will uh, make note of with this, um, this particular fish, which was on the current seam out there, um, I hooked the fish and I knew right away that it, it was big. It just acted like a big fish. It made one long, hard run without any head shakes. It grabbed it confidently and was running. And having a, I'm gonna turn this around so it's, no, it's like that. If you look at um, this, it's a seven foot medium power, moderate action St. Croix. It's actually the walleye series shallow cranker, but moderate action is important um, because it means there's a whole lot of bend well into the blank and that helped keep the fish hooked. Big fish have a way of getting off and um, you want to use every advantage and certainly having a you know, a rod with the moderate action that bends nicely is, is part of that. Uh, the other part is once I knew, hey, this is a good fish and I have it, I had it about that tight on the drag. And as soon as I realized, oh, that's a good fish, I just reached down and, and just gave it a quarter to half a turn. And at that point, the fish really made a long run and Jake caught up and, and I knew I had a pretty good indication I was gonna hold on to that fish. After I loosen it, obviously I'll tighten it back up for the next fish that grabs it. But that practice of, of loosening that drag a quarter turn, maybe a half turn, uh, saves me from losing a lot of fish. So give it a try, it may help you land the next big one. So I really am enjoying the stand-up stick steer. Um, it's, this is really the first time I've had it out here and you know, it's, you could call it a prototype, but for what, I don't know. I did it cause I wanted it and who knows, maybe someone will take the idea, run with it and offer this as a kit, but I'm going to jump up and give you the top down perspective on how this whole system works. So the first thing I do is I set, I set it at like, there's 46 Watts that'll work and i'll use the knob up here almost as a, a stand assist strap just to help pull myself up okay now that i'm up you can kind of see that the the line here kind of makes an m shape it goes up to the um i gotta make a turn real quick so i got trees coming up um you know it's attached to the the front of the foot control steering and I'm just moving that side to side and that's in essence you know making the the foot pegs move side to side as though you know as though I were moving it with my feet but it's nice because it's close and I don't have to bend down I can adjust this up so where it's a little bit closer to me I can reach back here, give myself a little bit more speed. I've found there's about 450 watts 
is the maximum out before it starts coming over the over the uh, the bow there and just filling this area which it's fine because there's a scupper hole underneath the seat but in essence the whole shape of the, the spectra cord it starts there goes up to one tie down eyelet comes up here goes through this stick steer uh, I have kind of little knots there on the side with washers it goes back up to the other one back here and then connects to the the foot control steering so let's just look at that I've got you can see I got a little bit of slap of slack in there that I gotta tighten up but that's to be expected with spectra cord it'll that'll stretch out and I'll tighten it up part of it gets tightened up when um, you make the adjustments to that piece right there the, um, the part with the screw balls but you know it's it's doing what I had hoped it would do just making you know I say small adjustments as I'm motoring and standing but it's uh, it's working better than I expected so I don't need big crisp turns but you know just small adjustments in the steering to go where I want to go is, uh, is working out real good I'm happy All right, we are continuing to catch them. This one's probably 18 inches or so, maybe a little bit less uh, hard pressed to get the action on film, but we're just enjoying our float back down. Uh, Jake just got one up there a little ways, um, probably 17, 17 and a half on a jackhammer. This one came on the same, uh, yeah, same shallow diving subsurface live target crayfish crankbait. We'll go ahead and get him back in. Thank you, sir. Zoom. There he goes. Looks like Jake got a good one. He hollered and I'm running down to see what he got. What'd you get? Nice. How big? 19 and 3 quarters. Beautiful fish. She was up underneath of a tree, um, getting underneath in that shade. And I skipped my bait up underneath of there. And What'd you get on? Jackhammer. Yep. Um, the, nice. the water on this side of the river is much more muddy, so that threw it up sense. underneath of there and she hammered it. She had some hops on her too. Yeah. Yeah, she jumped. Cool. Quite a bit. Very cool. So I'm gonna let her go. All right, let's get a picture quick. Okay. Hold her down, let her breathe for a yeah. second. 19 three quarter inch Susquehanna River smallmouth. We're gonna let her go. Got feisty. <laughs> I'm trying to go underneath Jeff's boat. There she goes. Nice catch, bud. Thanks. So one thing I took into account when I designed this is I don't want this in the way of my sidearm cast. So I really wanted it to be something that could be could be removed fairly easily and. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna set up my camera tripods up there, and I can't have this banging back and forth. If you if you just wanted to have it so you could do a sidearm cast, you can certainly push this down. But as I move the the foot pegs, it's gonna kick side to side. So what I'm gonna do to sort of disable this this whole system is I'm gonna go right here. And I'm just going to create slack by unhooking this, taking it off, and I will tighten that back up just so it's ready when I need it next time. So now that that's tight and secure, it in essence, and I'm just going to, I'm going to, you'll see, I'm just going to tuck it in there. Uh, it's there when I need it next time but it created slack so that my sliding foot pegs can do whatever it is they need to do to steer the boat you know when I have the stick steer disabled that didn't take long that's a good fish too 
loosen the drag. Let him do the running he wants to do. Oh, and he is running. Make sure that motor's off because he may dive underneath that. Another nice, probably 18 inch fish. We'll see. He might be bigger. He's certainly a heavy one. So this one was at the, the head of the island I just beached at. The grass bed's there, there's a ledge right above it. And this beautiful fish was uh, right above the grass, in between the grass and the, the ledge it was right above it. Pretty guy, see ya. Go back. Right. That's more like that. Um, you know, I, I haven't, since I started with the, uh, the subsurface, I haven't changed. There's no need to change from it. It's working. I will say one thing that has been important is where, yeah, you're at a, a grass bed. It seems like the grass bed works better if, if there's a deep drop off on one side. That seems like it's a... Um, you know, a good predictive of there being a big fish there. So, so if you do uh, loosen your drag during the fight, you always want to make sure you have the habit of coming back to it. Oh, came back after helping Jake with his his big fish. Came back to the same one I got the 18 and a half out of. Same Eddie, different fish. But certainly a productive one up at the, the head of the island there. Um, there's a big boulder in it. There's nice jump. There's a big boulder. It's ahead of a grass bed. There's a ledge above it. There's just a lot going on. A lot of a lot of different current breaks and habitat. You know, cover. Just, just a lot of variety of different things going on there, which are good for producing food for these fish. Good ambush points. Another nice one. Jake came up the other end of the island. Did you get anything on the way up? That's a beautiful fish. See ya. Jake's back on that same eddy. And it looks like he got a giant. Did you get him in the net? Yep. Nice job, man. So 18 and a half. That last one I got was probably 17 and a half. And Did you see what happened to this jackhammer? No. It came, it came right up in my face. Nice. There's fish right there. Yeah, three great fish out of that spot. It just has a lot going on. Eighteen and a half. Nice cookie cutter to the one I got. Beautiful. So many awesome fish in this river. Oh, well, she doesn't want her picture taken. That's okay. We got her on film. Well, this one just came at me too fast to even hit the record button. Like it just smashed it right as I was pulling it out of the water at the top of another grass bed. Beautiful fish. And immediately upstream from the grass bed is always a good recipe. Another night, another, I, I, is at least 18 inches. Really nice fish. See ya. So one of the reasons why I really like fishing a, a subsurface bait especially when there's a good top water bite going on, is that you just have a better hookup percentage with, that's a good fish, with the subsurface bait. Um, they just stay, stay buttoned. And I, I think they get it in their mouth better. You know, I think it's, it's absolutely a matter of 
when they go to the surface and they grab something that is top water, um, they have quite a bit of disorientation breaking the surface of the water. And you don't have that with the subsurface. This one's really big. With a bait that's right below the surface, you're still jumping. I think they can get a bead on it nicely and, and get it easily in their mouth. They, they really know, hey, you know, there it is. I fully see it. And there you are. You know, it's another nice fish. Here's the surface of the water. It's chugging along there. They can grab it without breaking the surface of the water with their eyeballs. Whereas the, the bait that's on the, the surface, they have to break, break the surface. And sort of in doing that, they, they temporarily lose track of where it is. You know, their mouth, you know, they're basically aiming for the last place they saw it instead of aiming for where it is. And, and that makes a big difference, you know. It's the same thing with snakehead. People love to throw those hollow bodied frogs for snakehead, but you miss them. You miss them all the time. I'm gonna show you this big fat fish. Look at him. <laughs> you miss the snakehead. I'm gonna dip him so he can breathe after that hard fight. They blow up on it. It's exciting. You wanna keep doing it, but the hookup percentage is bad on top water. Whereas if you go to a chatter bait, you get hook up. I mean, you, you, okay, I'm gonna let you go. You hook up better when you have that chatter bait wobbling just underneath the surface. You just catch more of them. And I think it really, it just boils down to when it's just below the surface, they get it in their mouth. That's all there is to it, as opposed to swatting it the last place that they saw it before they committed to, you know, coming across the surface and I almost got this out of you, buddy. Mm. Very heavy fish. Beauty. All right, we'll get him back in. So, subsurface instead of top water. See you, guy. Hey Jake. Yeah. Let's go find Dos Hamburguesas Grandes. <laughs> All right. You want to go eat? I'm hungry. Yeah. Let's eat. It's been a good day. All right. So it's the day after our trip, and it's time to do a more permanent patch. First thing we're gonna do is just peel off the uh, the terraid. Terraid is terraid type B is appropriate for this, but it's a it's a temporary fix. So we're gonna pull that off. I'll throw that away in a moment. And um, we're, I've actually opened the valve and we're gonna let all the pressure out of that. And I really want all of it out. I mean, really just, you know, you don't want any air trying to escape. I'll hold that down so it really goes concave. And, you know, we will be using the Aqua Seal. I'll put that aside. And I got a, a little patch of the material. I'm going to cut that to fit over where... Let's see, I've lost my hole already. But I'll find it here in a second. And uh, we'll, we'll just sand that area. I can see where it was. That's it right there. So um, I should also dry it. But we're going to sand it. I'll get a paper towel and dry it here in a minute. I'm going to sand it in different directions. It really just roughs it up. And I'm going to do the same thing once I cut cut this. I will I will sand the back side and then I'll apply the aqua seal. But let me get some paper towels and get a dry surface. After the, the sanding and the cleaning of all the surfaces is done, and it's dried, we got, that's the hole right there. I like it concave because it kind of holds the aqua seal. And I'm just, I'm gonna drizzle this on there and I'll spread it around. 
and I'll just smear that around. About the, I've also done this with HH66, which is the material that I use to put the the Yak Attack switch pads on, and I don't, I've not had as much success with leak patching with HH66 as I have with the Aqua Seal. Okay, now that we have that flat area completely coated, we're gonna push down on that. And that's it, and uh, it'll it'll take a little while for this to set up. But then I'm done. Then I got a fully functioning uh, inflatable kayak again after about, I don't know, 24 hours, maybe 36 hours of, of curing. That's it.